I'm excited about this next conversation. This is a systems approach to food is health. Um, every once in a while you work, with, you work with outside speakers, outside participants, and they come to you and they, they bring you an idea that really just kind of blows you away. And that was the case with this. Um, I got to meet Jeff Rochester, I'm trying to think how we were put together. Um, I, guess it, I guess it was through, okay. Okay, so um, we were put together and um, anyway, Jeff brought us this idea. He said, why don't, you, why don't you look at food as health and why don't you look at it from a systems approach? And he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out and find you, I'm gonna go out and find you four terrific people who can talk to you about this and can take you through it. And so I'm gonna let Jeff do the individual introductions, um, but I'm gonna turn it over now and uh, have at it. Great. Uh, okay, good. Um, so Jeff Rochester, honored, pleasure, thank you for the invite. Uh, you know, Dr. Lustig talked about how do we fix this, right? How do we fix it? And I think this panel is important because, and we're not going to get it all done. We've got about 30 minutes together. But we're going to have a conversation about all of the elements it would take to really make this happen. And if, if, you, if we had all the elements, it'd probably be 10 or 12 people represented up here. So this is a partial list. But I'm very happy to have Kelly Loth here from MindSpark Learning, Holly from Appalachian Regional Healthcare, Anastasia, who's our host with Brooklyn Grange, and a surprise new guest, Rachel Atchison. She was not on the original agenda, and she works with the office of the uh, Brooklyn Borough President of New York. And some of the themes we'll be exploring are urban versus rural. I think we think of urban centers, but we will have rural represented. We're gonna talk about education. We're gonna talk about jobs. We're going to talk about insurance, health insurance, and the role of the health insurers. So to get this going, my first question really, oh, and by the way, you'll note this is a very different kind of panel for today. So we have the women, and as they would say, if you want it done, and you want it done right, here we go. So let's have at it. So for each of you, why don't you just talk about your view on the topic, the topic being uh, food is health, preventative health care. Kelly, tell me your vision. What are you doing? Uh, what do you see as gaps? Yeah, I mean, if you want to feed people for the next 100 years, if you want to create more jobs and opportunity in ag tech, if you want to talk about sustainability, it all starts with education. And so for us, we are that upstream and downstream approach and that you have to get the next generations involved in these conversations. And it starts as early as age five. So really here to share what's working in education, and it can no longer be about education as kind of that afterthought, we've done this amazing investment, we've done this amazing gift, we've come to your community, oh, and by the way, we'll help with the education initiative. They have to be part of the ecosystem from the beginning, and we've created some really great strategies to do that. Holly, what's your view on the overall topic, and what are you seeing in Appalachia? Honestly, Jeff, we have to change the entire healthcare system in our country. I run a $3 billion healthcare system across one of the most poverty-stricken parts of our entire country in central Appalachia. And we are not incentivized by the insurance companies, the payers, to keep people healthy and well. Our money comes from taking care of those who are sick. And the highest margin comes from taking care of those who are the sickest, those, are in, those patients who are in a bed in our hospitals. That's where the margin is in healthcare. Great. Anastasia? Yeah, I think um, it's interesting timing to be having this conversation because this week is climate week. And uh, whenever I think about food and health, I think that, you know, from a sort of popular um, standpoint, when we think about food and health, we really think about personal wellness. And that's really a, a failure um, of big picture thinking because. When you look at healthy food, I mean, when you look at, for example, the organic movement, like where did it start? It started as an environmental movement. How we've shifted so far into thinking about food as health as a personal wellness movement, 
I, you know, I'm really not sure, but it, it, is, it is problematic. It's deeply problematic because at the end of the day, I think you'd be hard pressed to uh, make people sick eating food that's, uh, that is good for the planet. Um, so when I think about a systems approach to food as health, really what I think about is uh, where, where healthy individuals and a healthy environment meet. Um, and of course, that's what we're all about at Brooklyn Grange. And I come to this conversation uh, through Eric Adams' health journey. About five years ago, he was diagnosed with late stage diabetes. Uh, and he was blind in his left eye, tingling in his fingers and toes, was told he'd have to take insulin the rest of his life, and looked at food, uh, looked at what he was eating, changed to a whole food plant-based diet, reversed the diabetes completely, got rid of the blindness in his left eye, no more tingling, lost 35 pounds, and came to this realization that it wasn't just a personal choice, there are governmental choices that can be made. Um, so that is, that is my approach to this conversation. Great, so let's talk about the role of government and, and starting with Rachel and then I'd love to hear from Holly and also Anastasia. So talk about the vision statement that you and Eric announced in February. Yeah. Be very relevant for this group and tell us how you would want to execute that plan. So back in February we released a report entitled The New Agrarian Economy uh, and it really looked at what, uh, how do we feed the healthcare crisis and what can we do to prevent the healthcare crisis by looking upstream, as I think Kelly, you mentioned. Uh, so when we're talking about procurement dollars, the procurement dollars of New York City for either its food in the hospital system, the, the school lunch program uh, in um, the correctional facilities um, is immense. And right now, that budget is not going largely to institutions like the Brooklyn Grange. It's not going to places that I've already talked to the few folks here you all have invested in. Um, it is uh, sadly going to kind of the status quo that it has always gone to. Um, and we are looking to, to really change that um, paradigm in New York. Great, and Brooklyn, and you're, you're right here in Brooklyn. Talk about your relationship with the city, the government, what do you think could be done more in terms of support from city for the kind of things you're trying to get done, Anastasia? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a tremendous need um, that COVID really laid bare, but that's always existed for, uh, for food sovereignty. In a city like New York that's as diverse, um, that is a huge challenge, right? Food sovereignty is the right of all people to food that is healthy, uh, culturally appropriate, produced in a sustainable uh, and environmentally healthy way, um, and people's right to agency over the food systems uh, that feed them. I mean, approaching a city like New York with that goal in mind of creating you know, food sovereignty across the board is, is incredibly challenging. Um, what I will say is that it's been really wonderful to, to work with Eric Adams' office, for example, as our borough president here in Brooklyn, because um, it can be really difficult to approach these conversations by trying to find solutions for all of New York City, let alone all of the United States or the whole globe. Um, so, you know, I encourage us to when we're talking about systems, rather than thinking about creating a whole system that feeds the entire planet, um, rather, think about discrete systems. It can, it can be a lot more challenging to do so, but discrete systems um, that intersect to create those huge solutions. So, and, and it, I'm out of my wheelhouse a little bit, but, but go a layer deeper. So, you look at a company like App Harvest. They'll produce 40 million pounds of tomatoes shipped out of Kentucky to the rest of the country. That's one model, certainly. Uh, we have vegetables and fruits imported from Mexico. Another model. Uh, the whole notion of community gardens, rooftop gardens, et cetera. Talk about scalability. Is that a viable strategy for an urban center like New York? And, or is that more being done for educational purposes, et cetera? So how does an urban center really feed itself as locally grown as possible? Yeah, and I think you're reading between the lines of what I'm saying, which is that a model like Brooklyn Grange is not about scale, right? If you're looking for a scalable model, you should be looking at, you know, aeroponic, greenhouses uh, built in peri-urban centers that can crank out you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds of, 
uh, leafy greens, tomatoes, um, leafy greens, tomatoes. Um, and, <laughs> and if you're looking to, 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 to serve other needs, I mean, this is what I'm saying, right? When we talk about health, we're not just talking about making sure that folks get vegetables on their plate. We're talking about uh, education. We're talking about people's ability to feel a sense of autonomy over what's on their plate. Um, and having a local urban farm, uh, you know, that might be as meaningful to some folks as having access to low cost or no cost vegetables. So yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm gonna burst some bubbles here when I say like, we could try and scale as quickly as possible, but Brooklyn Grange is never gonna make a dent in New York City's food supply. That's, that's not the point of this. Um, but we, we can serve a lot of other functions in this sort of systems approach to, to a healthier uh, food system. Uh, Holly, talk about the role of government, state, federal, local. Um, I, uh, App Harbor's CEO, Jonathan Webb, he and I would talk, we would text early during COVID, right? March, April, May 2020, dark days. I'm living in New York, he's living in Kentucky, rural community. We would talk about, you know, is this, is this disease that's blowing up in urban centers, would it ever hit rural? We would talk about the fact that why is no one talking about diet, right? We talk about pre-existing, you know, COVID shined a light on pre-existing conditions, comorbidity. Those became like the language of, of our society, and yet you didn't hear people having this conversation about diet. So, you know, I, I would fantasize, I would say if I was de Blasio, right, I would, I would go into these urban centers and I would be dispensing pills and advice to reduce heart disease, blood pressure as soon as possible, but interventions, interventions. So Holly, talk about the role of the state, the Fed, your experience. This data is known, is. but no one seems to be doing anything about it. So what more could be done? There's a lot that could be done, Jeff, and I could talk about this all day, but you know, in Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia, we are totally dependent on either Medicare or Medicaid. Those are the provide; those are the payers that cover our patient population. So, without the government, we have no payment in Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia. But they are not focused on health and well-being. They are not focused on bringing fruits and vegetables into the communities and making our population healthier. You know, one model that we have been tossing around that. I think has a lot of merit is creating a quote pharmacy next to our retail pharmacy rather than giving out blood pressure medicine and diabetes medication let's pass out fruits and vegetables let's think in a novel way and we need whether it's federal or state government to partner with us on those efforts right and Kelly talk about uh, what the public school system in this country What's their view on this conversation, food and nutrition, and who's really driving it? Like, are, do, are parents demanding better food for their kids? Do the parents care? Do the teachers care? Talk about the state of play of this conversation in education. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, it's not surprising, right? So in places that are more affluent and people have more access, then parents care, and they're making, they're raising a stink about the quality of food that's served to their children, and in hard to serve, hard to reach areas and communities, they're not because they have other concerns on their plate, um, literally. And so we see a lot of disparity in the quality of food across the country under all of the umbrella of the same public education system. And I think where we see hope and where we get excited is when we start to involve the community at a hyper-localized level in global solution making, and when we start to involve our students as part of the solution and really having them actually generate viable ideas and having them be part of the process of what it means to be a healthy person, be a healthy individual. And when you get kids excited about health, they become ambassadors for their families and they become ambassadors for their community. And you see behavior change. So you see kids telling their parents, turn your car off in the hug and go lane. You're polluting the air. Mom, we have to serve this kind of food tonight because it's better for us. So they start to change the behavior in their families and that's I think a hopeful message, but I think there's a lot of work to be done at a system level for how we feed children in a captive <laughs> way during the school day so when they don't have a choice. Let me piggyback off that. You know, we partner a lot with our school systems across the service area that we serve, and 
that's where you have to start making a difference is in those early elementary school children and in in the world that we're in we have a lot of grandparents who are raising their grandchildren because their parents are in prison or addicted to drugs and not able to take care of their children so we have to start with education and it has to be an investment Get Kelly Kelly talk a minute about and, and you and I had this conversation around Earth Day 2020 uh, and 2021. Talk about the cultural nuances. Uh, when I, again, you guys do this for a living, I don't. So the conversations I had about a year ago about why is there no got milk for fruits and vegetables? Where is the national program? That's a call to action. It's Meatless Monday. But why aren't there more programs like that? And Kelly, you cautioned me about attacking this through a national ubiquitous solution for schools and kids because of the role of culture and geography. Yeah, I mean, I think one size doesn't fit all when it comes to the issue around food and health. I think that, again, coming into communities not necessarily with an answer, but with the idea to co-design and co-develop solutions and create opportunities and access models for them is something that's going to get us a lot further than just saying, here it is. I was the principal of a very, very deeply impacted title school in Colorado, and we wanted to feed our kids you know, healthier. You can't just drop fruits and vegetables and celery and carrots on a plate and expect them that they're going to choose that over pizza or they're going to suddenly go home and make that something that becomes a habit. You have to start with educating them and understanding the community restraints, the community obstacles, the challenges that people face, um, and the solution has to be homegrown, which is kind of hard to say because all we've heard today is it's about scale and it's about this idea of you know investing majorly in ag tech and opportunity, but we have to figure out how to take those big global solutions and actually make them um, accessible to communities that we care about and we serve. And so that's my caution is you have to understand who's on the ground that's going to be consuming these products. I'm going to drive to some audience participation. Uh, how many of you are investors in this space? Keep your, hand, keep your hands up if you, if you don't mind. How many of you have had this conversation with your portfolio companies about their broader ambition around nutrition and food? Oh, a lot of you have. Okay, great. So David Lee is in the audience. So David Lee, uh, president of App Harvest, publicly traded, uh, producing 40 million pounds of tomatoes a year. Well, uh, business model is to have seven, eight greenhouses in the next five years. Is this a conversation you guys have? Because your day job is growing tomatoes. So where does this conversation, nutrition, health, fit within the management team's priorities and, your, and, and what your investors want to see you guys talking about? Well, I mean, the hard truth of the matter is, Mike. I think the hard truth of the matter is that adoption is local in food. Food's like identity politics, right? You know, when I used to talk at big conferences about who here is a vegetarian, hands would shoot up with pride. And when I would say, who here loves to eat meat, you know, nowadays people kind of go like this. Right. And, and so the, the hard reality is our approach at App Harvest is to get to scale faster than anyone by accessing the largest amounts of capital and executing well. But at the same time, we're trying to create demand locally across all of you. You know, the container farms in rural eastern Kentucky to train the next generation so that we can create pull. And it's hard. I mean, the great experiment of App Harvest is under the harsh scrutiny of being public, traded on NASDAQ, can you get to scale, get that capital, and at the same time, create local adoption systemically? Um, so we talk about it all the time. I think w one comment is the systemic problem we face in food and health combined can be really depressing, that you're all articulating. You know, when you hear uh, no one's funding this, and that has to be done in your local neighborhood. But I, the, the encouraging comment I would make is that consumerism is powerful. And 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when I was at Del Monte and we were trying to push more fruits and veg on schools nationwide, no one cared. But today, consumers, it's, it's, it went from less than maybe the 15th important reason to pick food, affordability and taste, mm -hmm. right, were the two. It's now in almost every national survey across all socioeconomic groups within the top five. Health, impact on planet. So I just want to give you guys some encouragement because I, I know what you guys go through, but there are powerful uh, global forces. Capitalism is one of them. The SPAC phenomenon, whatever you want to say about it, 
created a lot of access to capital that can, that can break this regime. Great. Uh, Bob, I'm going to bring you into this next conversation in a minute. But so let's talk about the ecosystem. Uh, you, re you represent about a third, a half of the players. Let's talk about the role of health insurers specifically. And Holly, I'm going to lean on you, but I want to start with Rachel and just go down the line. When you think about what you're trying to build in Brooklyn, what you could ultimately be building for the five boroughs, what is the role of the insurance providers and, and how do you see addressing uh, their accountability and responsibility? Yeah. So we've had conversations with several health insurance companies in New York uh, about piloting different, different programs. Um, we are not at the level of saying, hey, this is a, this, the scale is not there um, for some of the programs that we want to pilot, um, but um, we want to show that there is interest and we want to show metrics of, of success. Um, so we've had initial conversations with, the, with a lot of the companies in the space um, because at the end of the day, I think it makes the most sense financially for them to get involved. Um, but we have not seen any success that, that I'm able to tout today. Okay. Anastasia, any point of view about the health insurers? You know, I actually think that they could be a part of the solution of funneling these sort of global uh, concepts uh, and creating more local um, applications for them. Um, you know, I, I can't, that one size fits all uh, approach, you know, Kelly said it perfectly, it's, it's just food is not a one size fits all um, problem. Uh, and, you know, if we're trying to think about triple bottom line businesses, right, we should be thinking about that fourth P which is partnerships, you know, App Harvest might be trying to scale as fast as possible and might struggle to, in that sense to uh, continue to maintain close ties to small uh, communities about their distinct needs, but there's a partner out there that would love to access that type of scale uh, and, and tie it to the, the unique and discrete needs of uh, their community. And I think that partner could theoretically be uh, the insurer. It would be a very different system. So I'm really, I'm, not, I'm in very interested to hear what Holly has to say about this. Um, there's a lot to say about this. Um, <laughs> the insurers are not at the table today having this conversation, Jeff. I mean, they, they just are not. And it starts, you would, for example, a well child visit. When you take your child for their annual visit, what do they do? Height, weight, check to see if they've had their vaccines, and that's it. There's no discussion about what is your child eating? How can we improve your child's diet? Is your child exercising? How can we get your child access to fruits and vegetables? How can we get your child exercising and more active in his or her life? The insurers have the capital to come partner with us as health systems to totally transform the way that health is delivered in our country. Great. So, so Bob, let me, you know, you're a smart guy. I loved your, your, uh, your speech earlier. How do we get the insurers on board? Like, A, do you know of any best practices? Is anyone doing anything in this space? Preventative health care from an insurance provider. And if they're not there, how do we get them there? No one's doing it yet. They're all talking about it, and no one's doing it. I've had those discussions with them, so I know that they know. Uh, there are a few uh, small uh, pockets of, uh, uh, of interest. Uh, I work with a company out of Philadelphia that is a dietary management company that has uh, partnered with Holy Redeemer uh, a Health System down in Philadelphia to do just this. We don't have uh, outcomes data yet. We're doing it now. So hopefully that will move, the, move the, uh, the, the ball. However, having said that, there are ways to make this work. Let me, and, and digitally and for no cost. Let me give you an example. Let's say Jeff, you have metabolic syndrome and gout and kidney stones. Thank you. 
Thank you. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to do that to any of the ladies. <laughs> All right, you need, you need a low refined carbohydrate, low added sugar, low purine, low oxalate diet. Now, you go into a grocery store, what the hell are you gonna buy? Do you have any blessed clue what you should buy? Nope. No. No. Any of that on a label? Any, any dietitian gonna be able to help you navigate that? All right, so what if you subscribed to a service that had your biochemical profile and file you know, on online, and you put into this uh, portal, you know, I'd like chicken cacciatore for dinner tonight. That's all you have to do. Hit the button, everything else is done for you. First thing that happens, you pull up the biochemical profile. Okay, Jeff Rochester needs a low, refined carbohydrate, low added sugar, low purine, low oxalate diet. Then goes to a database of a million recipes, finds the chicken cacciatore recipes, finds the one that is the lowest in all four of those. Then looks at the grocery store that you frequent and picks out the ingredients for that chicken cacciatore dish that actually meets your metabolic profile, orders them, shows up on your doorstep with, from Amazon Fresh with the recipe, and the cost of those foods end up getting charged to the insurance company because they're going to mean that you don't need your insulin or your oral hypoglycemic or your allopurinol, and they get to keep the rest. Win, 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 win. The point is that that level of personalized nutrition exists. It exists today. And I'm actually chief medical officer of the company that's doing that. And I'll be happy to talk about that. The point is that the insurance company, they want to do this. But they won't do it until we show it works. And right. that's what we're doing in Philadelphia. So stay tuned. So, so this, this, that, that's a, a great segue. Because I also want to talk about, in general, the role of private sector, uh, specifically the role of grocery chains. Right, and, and uh, Holly, I, I have a specific question uh, for you about rural, but, but Kelly, in your, the philosophy of MindSpark, uh, the group you represent, is deeply rooted in working with private sector. Talk about your philosophy on education and private sector, making it more pragmatic for kids, and I want to apply that to this conversation on food and nutrition. Yeah, I mean, education can't do this by itself. Um, you know, every time someone wants to talk about education, they describe it as very broken. And I would say it's not necessarily broken, but it is redeemable. But we can't do it by ourselves. And so industry and education have to come together in an ecosystem. And, and food and health and climate change and all of these conversations are key uh, problems to be solving, right? And like I said before, it starts with education. And so having industry come forward and not, again, in a shallow way, say, we're going to think about it as an afterthought or we're going to sprinkle some materials here, we're going to drop in a program that we're not sure people are going to really show up to take, is not the answer. The answer is becoming part of the DNA of what it means to teach and learn, um, and to actually show students at an early age what the possibilities are in career fields, in ag tech, um, in solving these problems, and not only mentoring them, but actually giving them problems to solve, and giving them feedback, and saying, I love that idea, and I love that idea so much that as an eight-year-old, I'm going to invest in your idea, and I'm going to help you scale it. So, and that's not a pipe dream that's happening now. That's happening across the country. It's happening in schools that we work with. But again, we have to do a better job of intersecting industry and education in meaningful and authentic ways um, if we're going to, again, not be sitting in this room having the same conversation in the next 20 to 30 years. So here's the model. Um, IBM wants to be a category leader in AI. What's the project you're working on with IBM? We'll train 100,000 educators in North America in artificial intelligence over the next 15 months. And we'll do so in a way that makes AI accessible to educators, whether you teach kindergarten or whether you teach AP physics in high school. And the idea is, is that AI is part of everything we do. It's part of this ecosystem. Earlier today, we heard about how 
things work really well when they're cross-disciplinary and they're cross-pollinated. So the idea that AI doesn't live in a vacuum, it touches everything that we do, including food and health. And so we have to have students exposed to that early on. And educators don't know what they don't know. They didn't grow up in a high-tech environment and industry. They mostly grew up through education. So the more that we can upskill educators in these topics that are really critical to changing outcomes for all of us, um, that's key. And so we do that in a way where we partner with companies to take something rich and meaty like AI or food and healthcare. And we put it on the table and we help upskill educators in that um, so that students ultimately have access to career and viable pathways, a family sustaining wage, ultimately healthier environments, better communities, all of the above. So here's how to connect the dots. So Rachel, as you think about the vision that you and Eric have for this conversation in Brooklyn and then the larger area, what's the role of Whole Foods or the grocery store chains? For example, Kroger, as large as Kroger is, could create a program through MindSpark and somebody else. National program, food and nutrition across this country, train 200,000 teachers in food and nutrition and drive that down into the kids. So, you know, having heard this conversation, you guys may already have a plan, but what is the role, what is the role in your mind of, and I'll add the drugstore chains to this also because they're a point of contact with the public. Have you guys conceptualized the role of grocery stores and drugstores in your vision to make uh, Brooklyn and the surrounding areas a healthier uh, through preventative healthcare and nutrition? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot there in that, uh, and so I will say I, today I decided to be here instead of on a panel talking about healthy bodegas. Um, so we've got uh, another person in our office who's covering that. Um, there's a, a lot of, of entry points um, that we see there, and you know I, I can't comment uh, on to you know what is going to happen uh, later in the year, um, but the work that we have already done. Um, touches kind of everything that, that you all have already said. I mean, we have invested, um, we've invested millions in actually getting the kids to grow the food in the classroom. If they are growing the food, they're going to eat the food. Um, and we, we see that a across the board. Um, but we have not had those conversations with, uh, with large scale, with the Trader Joe's, with the Whole Foods. Um, it has not been a, a part of the program yet, um, again, during, during this conversation, cannot comment to the future, um, but those are the conversations that we want to be having because this conversation, whether it's from the food is health lens or whether it's from the climate change lens, I mean, this conversation is the next big conversation. Um, you all are just invited to the party a little early uh, because we're all going to see um, this be at the center of the conversation for years to come. Anastasia, any thought? If you, if you could wave a magic wand and, and command Whole Foods and other retailers in the New York area, what would you want them to do? I mean, I'd want them to listen. Again, I can't stress enough that I think listening is just such a critical part of building healthy food systems. When we started this farm here in Sunset Park, you know, we are a food retailer. We have a farmer's market up here on a weekly basis. Uh, but we also work really closely with NYU Langone's uh, food pantry, The Table, which is a free choice model. It's set up like a supermarket uh, so that folks in the community can come and take the products that are culturally relevant, comfort foods, applicable to their family's menu and diet, uh, rather than just being handed a bag of you know whatever the pantry is packing that week that may or may not be desirable or even feasible for them. Some of the residents of this neighborhood don't have access to refrigeration or uh, you know, gas cooking. Um, so certain vegetables might just be basically go straight in the trash. Um, working with the table's been great because we get that feedback. We get that feedback directly from the community about not just like what's appropriate, but when we started this farm, we had the conversation with our farmers that, you know, at the Navy Yard, our, which is our second location, that community, it's a lot of singles living in apartments, making mason jar salads and bringing them to work to eat at their desks or wherever you eat now in COVID. And, and those, you know, when you're bunching carrots for your CSA program in the Navy Yard, those bunch sizes are going to look very different than your bunch sizes in Sunset Park 
where there's six, eight people living in a, in a, in a residence, three generations sharing a kitchen. Um, so retailers need to be, need to be doing more listening uh, at a local level. Um, and we see it. You know, we saw Wegmans open in Brooklyn. They were all over our farm. They were all looking for introductions to local community leaders to, to really listen closely to what it is that the specific neighborhood they were opening in. And, and that's why you see them scaling slower, because they take the time to have those conversations. So I think, think there is, we are moving into the future of retail uh, that we need to be moving towards just very slowly. And then Holly, uh, I, I, so born in Barbados, live in Brooklyn, spent Earth Day 2021 in Eastern Kentucky, uh, driven by Bree 400 miles, visiting your hospitals. So Taking tomatoes. Taking tomatoes. But you know what? I didn't see a lot of where Kroger's or other food stores out there. What I did see were Dollar Generals, literally like every five miles. So from your perspective, what more could the grocery retail uh, channel be doing more to help you in what you're trying to get done? I think there's a lot they could be doing, Jeff. I think, first of all, is providing access. Take a risk. Come into one of our communities. Provide access to fruits and vegetables, organic options, healthy options. In eastern Kentucky, we have an obesity epidemic. Forty percent of the population is morbidly obese. At the same time, you think about an obese population, they're living in a food desert. They're going to the Dollar General, and that is where they buy their groceries, in the center aisles, in boxes, and wrappers. And there's no way people can sustain a healthy lifestyle without access points coming into rural America. So the, our panel has come to an end. I, I think you can see the panelists are all exceptionally passionate about this topic. They're going to be around later, but just a round of applause.